Okay, so let's see. I woke up this morning and my house was on fire. I learned that I didn't have any arms or legs. And now suddenly I have a bunch of college debt. All of these things put me at an incredible disadvantage, so I guess I'm gonna have to do what I always do when money's tight. <sighs> I'm gonna read the quickie again. Well guys, at least today's topic is gonna be a fun one. Today we'll be looking at the love quest, and anything else that might run adjacent. Let's get right into this. The love quest, or sweetheart search, was the longest real-life saga of Christian Weston Chandler. His goal was to obtain a girlfriend. The stated purpose of the love quest was to meet the woman who would be his true love, solve all of his problems, and bear his daughter, Crystal. The love quest represented a focused effort to do everything in his power to achieve romantic fulfillment, except of course improving himself. While Chris maintained a belief in waiting for marriage to have sex due to his religious principles, or at least waiting until fully committing to a romantic relationship after at least three dates, Chris started moving away from the idea of being faithful as he interacted with a number of fake sweethearts, down to wanting sex from Jackie first and foremost when he first started communicating with her, and later being open to being in an open relationship where he could sleep with other people rather than a monogamous one. Because of this, Chris's antics are derisively referred to as the fuck quest. Over the next decade, from 2003 to 2018, the love quest was ongoing, with Chris unsurprisingly not having made any progress whatsoever in finding a romantic partner. In April 2012, he lost his virginity to a prostitute, which was mainly motivated by fear of going to jail for the Michael Snyder incident. He ultimately got a slap on the wrist instead of having to serve hard time. During early 2018, Chris was brainwashed by the idea guys into ending his love quest. He was told that he was happily married to several of his fictional OCs. Unfortunately, that was not the end of this story, as Chris went from believing in this marriage to eventually having sex of very questionable consent with his own mom, which did result in Chris serving hard time. Origins Background The catalyst for the love quest was Christian's encounter with Sarah Hammer, on whom he had a crush during his move back to Rutgersville, and his enrollment in the Piedmont, Virginia Community College. This occurred somewhere between June 2000 and October 2003. Sarah is presumably the first woman of any significance to tell the ever-naive Christian, I have a boyfriend. Chris was surprised to learn that his childhood gal pal was romantically involved with Wes Isley. Upon making this discovery, he quickly developed an intense jealousy of Isley, who he didn't even know, and a resentment towards him that would set the state of his mind for the impending quest. Throughout 2003, Chris passively expressed his longing and envy by way of Chris plus Sarah's life shares and BFF's best friends forever. It is clear that Chris at some point decided Sarah was supposed to be his soulmate, although perhaps not until he learned she was unavailable, and had difficulty accepting that this would not be a possibility. In 2005, following Sarah's breakup with Isley and hookup with William Spicer, he dealt with the situation more openly and publicly in Sonichu No. 2. This acceptance perhaps stemmed from his turn to a new object of infatuation. See the Megan section below. We'll be getting there soon. Epiphany According to Chris, the genesis of the love quest proper was his 21st birthday, the 24th of February 2003. On this date, he was kicked out of his college English class after a dispute with his teacher. In his Wikipedia biography, Chris claimed the teacher ejected him simply on account of his autism, which of course bears no resemblance to reality. When asked about it again later by a girlfriend, he deigns to mention that it may have had something to do with belligerently slandering classmates and making racist remarks. At any rate, while waiting for his next class, Chris sat and cried his eyes out, resenting that nobody was there to comfort him like there was at his graduation. Shortly thereafter, he resolved that he needed a girlfriend. Presumably, the connection between these events is that Chris felt hurt and ostracized by his punishment, leading him to recognize his need for someone who would appreciate him unconditionally. However, Chris further states that the love quest officially began in August of 2003, suggesting that he waited six months to actually execute his plans. Salad Days At some point early on in the quest, Chris developed an intense, socially crippling fear that all women, at least the women he likes, have boyfriends. Since his autism causes him to approach social tasks with the bluntest manner possible, it can be inferred that his initial approach was to walk up to women out of nowhere and frankly ask if they would go out with him. It may be further inferred that Chris's unrelenting persistence made it extremely difficult for a woman he liked to get rid of him, short of claiming to have a boyfriend. In any case, Chris quickly lost nearly all of his confidence in talking to women and developed an irrational hatred of boyfriends, or jerks. In example, all men everywhere except himself and his father. Since this time, he has always specified that his potential girlfriend must be a boyfriend-free girl, which is unnecessary outside of some kind of polygamous arrangement. Conflict with Mary Lee Walsh 
By October 2003, Crisson put into practice what was the only sensible idea he could come up with that was inexpensive. Sitting on the PVCC campus holding a sign that read, I am a 21-year-old male seeking an 18-21-year-old to 21 year old single female companion. This would be the first of many versions of the attraction sign, a vital tool in the love quest for several years to come. Sometime during October, the school's Dean of Student Services, Mary Lee Walsh, confronted Chris and confiscated his sign. According to Chris's recollection of the event, then in mid-October, the quote-unquote Dean of Student Services, Mary Lee Walsh, approached me and pulled my sign away from me and told me, you're not allowed to find true love here. My heart was shattered that very moment. Quick's Wikipedia biography, 3rd of May 2009. What is far more likely to have occurred is this. Walsh probably decided Chris was making a nuisance of himself and asked him what he thought he was doing. Chris probably delivered a big confusing monologue about seeking true love, and Walsh then likely dismissed the substance of Chris's response with, you can't do that here. Walsh's point of contention was undoubtedly just a sign, whatever Chris may have had to say about it. Undaunted by Walsh, Chris simply made a new sign, but a few weeks later Walsh confronted him again. In late January 2004, Chris revised his strategy, leaving copies of the Sonichu's News-Newsletter strewn about the campus, each one containing a single personal's ad about himself. By February, Walsh had cracked down on Chris again, banning the distribution of the news dash. Owing to repeated violations of campus policy, Walsh took Chris to her office to discuss the problem with him. In Chris's own words, Then that B-dog ripped up my notes and all, dragged me to her quarters, and talked down to me very rudely and hoarsely. I reacted with my own attack that she had been asking for the whole time. I was kicked out of PVCC for a year, and I had to take an anger management course and see a psychiatrist for a while. The extent of the attack Chris made against Walsh, whether it was physical or just a curse yehameha, is unknown, although it would have been something pretty serious to get him suspended from PBCC and forced to undergo counseling. The timing of the incident is also unclear, but Chris has cited the 16th of December 2004 as the date of his suspension. Conflicts with Jerk Ops by August 2004, Chris had expanded his quest to other attraction locations besides PVCC, such as Charlottesville Fashion Square. It was here that he attempted a new tactic, inspired by Excel Saga, laying a red string of fate across the mall floor. This inevitably led to a confrontation with mall security, making this Chris's first recorded encounter with the Jerk Ops. By September, Chris had somehow learned that loitering in public places with a sign advertising his services as a boyfriend made it look like he was trying to sell himself like a new car, but he still managed to miss the point and believe this was something he could work to his advantage. He continued to have confrontations with mall security until the 11th of September 2004, when he was arrested, handcuffed, and forbidden from entering the mall without one of his parents. With both of his attraction locations denied to him, Chris became more lonely and depressed than usual. In his diary, he expressed an interest in asking Santa Claus for a girlfriend. According to emails leaked by Jackie, Chris was completely serious and believed in Santa until he was 24. Anna McLaren At some point in 2004, Chris had expanded his activities in the mall, including pacing around a lot, playing video games on his Game Boy Advance SP, shouting at walls, or singing random songs from memory now and then. He was apparently infamous to Anna McLaren and her friends by the time he finally worked up the nerve to enter the store where Anna worked to strike up a conversation with her. Anna handled herself as politely as she could while having zero interest in his pathetic romantic overtures, and apparently convinced him that she was off the market. Despite becoming one of Chris's closest friends, Anna would later document the 2004 incident in a 2006 blog post, confirming that, despite whatever good qualities she sees in Chris, deep down she knows he's a few electric hedgehog Pokemon short of a chaotic combo. That was pretty good, I liked that one. On the 29th of March 2005, Chris, who had somehow regained full access to the mall, momentarily believed his prayers had been answered when he was approached by Hannah, a girl who worked at the local Starbucks. She invited Chris to have coffee with her. Chris quickly overreacted to the sudden reversal of fortune, calling his mother and showing Hannah his entire Sonichu scrapbook. Anna McLaren later informed Chris that Hannah was simply trolling him for the lulls. In shock, Chris confronted Hannah and, when she admitted the truth, he ran away screaming, No! He apparently made enough of a scene to get himself banned from the mall again. Subsequently, he dramatized the whole story in the comic, where he was able to get the last word in exactly the way he could not in real life. Megan Schroeder Chris met Megan Schroeder in the summer of 2005 and was immediately attracted by such qualities as her gender, her lack of a boyfriend, and her willingness to talk to him. In Chris's mind, these are key factors that meant Megan was already destined to be his sweetheart, and the only thing left to do was to convince Megan to accept this truth. 
The love quest was effectively on hold from this time until March 2008. All of Chris's writings during this time demonstrate that he believed he was already in a monogamous relationship with Megan and further sweetheart searching was unnecessary. Aside from Megan's complete disinterest in romance with Chris, the relationship suffered other stumbling blocks, such as Megan's discomfort at Chris showering her with gifts, Megan's outrage over Chris's sexual harassment, hatred of men, and rampant homophobia. Megan's unwillingness to share a hypothetical hotel room with Chris, and most damagingly, Megan's discovery that Chris had to draw himself finger-banging her to suppress his fantasies of assaulting and raping her. Even though she reacted as any normal human being would in the same situation, he was still shocked that she broke up with him and thought all he had to do was say, I'm sorry, as much as possible. Chris's obsession with Encyclopedia Dramatica is what led to the end of the friendship, since his attempts to blow E.D.'s mind by posting his own Rule 34 drawings caused her to discover what a deranged individual he truly was and break off all contact with him. Chris totally missed the point about the finger-banging picture, believing that its continued presence on E.D. was the issue, and ludicrously that Megan didn't understand what was going on in it. This contributed to his drive to shut down the site for much of 2008 until people on the internet figured out the simplest way to troll him. Internet Love Quest After becoming an infamous law cow thanks to his edit war with E.D., Chris began to receive unexpected attention from attractive single women who loved his comics and totally weren't just looking to troll him. Since then, Chris has taken his love quest onto the internet proclaiming that his true and honest sweetheart is whichever girl he's managed to pin down. Chris, or someone impersonating Chris, has at one point attempted appealing to Yahoo answers on how a lonesome fella can attract a boyfriend-free girl, going as far as mentioning his previous tactics and even asking his answerer to be his sweetheart. With each sweetheart he meets online, Chris follows a predictable pattern, demonstrating what he had always intended to do with any woman he met in real life. He begins with a series of proclamations of his true and honest love, and then begins planning out how the woman will travel to his home. Chris professes to believe in the rule that sex is out of the question until the third date, but since he expects every romantic encounter to end in total success, he makes it clear, in as gentlemanly a fashion as he can manage, that he expects sex on the woman's earliest convenience. Amazingly, as each successive internet gal pal proves to be a troll, Chris becomes more devoted to the next one, to the point that within a month of meeting Ivy online, he began planning his marriage to a woman he had never even seen face to face. When addressing the question of why Chris readily takes each new troll at face value, his own mindset must be taken into consideration. Chris's prospects of finding a girl locally are virtually zero, and he knows this, although he thinks it's because they all already have boyfriends. At the same time, the internet seems, from his point of view, to be an endless cavalcade of single, attractive women who are fascinated with him, making it an irresistible resource in his love quest. By now, Chris is fully aware that each woman he meets online could be a troll, but each time he readily accepts evidence that she is not and dismisses out of hand any suggestion that she is. He does this because he wants to believe she's real. The alternative is to surrender to despair. Notably, in July 2009, a group of trolls managed to set up a genuine date with Chris and an overweight woman named Farron. Chris supposedly touched her a few times, but the date ended with Farron dumping him. Returning to real life. In Chris's final chat with Sarah May from early March 2009, he claimed that he planned to give up on looking for a sweetheart online and return to searching for a girl in local Charlottesville. Trolls everywhere rejoiced, for this could only mean one thing, a return to the fabled attraction sign in the days of his exploits against the jerk ops and his other IRL misadventures. This effort only lasted so long, however. Chris's attempt at a real-life date with Emily ended in tragedy for him after the intervention of the man in the pickle suit. During the brief Rollin' and Trollin' era in the early summer of 2009, Chris was allegedly spotted prowling Charlottesville Fashion Square in his Guitar Hero Metallica tattoo sleeves, but it wasn't long before he gave up, or was simply banned from the CFS and retreated back to the internet. In late October 2009, after a long hiatus, the sweetheart cycle began again. With the advent of the incredibly disturbing I love you, Casey, Chris initially found success in this campaign to pry Casey away from her current boyfriend, Liquid Chris, even managing to meet her in person on multiple occasions. Later, though, the relationship collapsed under the weight of Chris's bizarre and disturbing behavior. The opening months of 2010 saw Chris land himself in romantic misadventures in reality and online. He managed to pry himself out of his room for a while and in the process meet a real person, the Wallflower. Like Megan, however, she rebuffed all of his attempts at a more than friendly relationship and eventually cut off all contact with him. Meanwhile, one of his online personal ads led to an extended conversation with another potential sweetheart. But Chris tripped over his duck long before he ever got the chance to meet Jackie in real life. 
Despite this, Chris believed that he had found another way to attract females, this time via the Flipnote Hatena, which is, despite being accessed on a DSi, still on the internet. Between the 17th of June and 2nd of July 2010, Chris ignored Flipnote Hatena's family-friendly policies and attempted to use it like a dating site. A lot of Chris's tags towards the female members were flirtatious to a point, and he even made a Flipnote calling out to every woman he tagged or tagged him. However, despite the trolls swarming into attack, non-troll responses were made by girls he tagged, most of whom were in their tweens to early teens. 2014 to 2017. Chris made numerous OkCupid okay profiles and has successfully attracted a sweetheart through it, Catherine. Once her gig was up, Chris began to plumb the depths of derangement with videos advertising himself to women of any orientation. Since as a trans woman, Chris believes he now physically appeals to straight, bisexual, and lesbian women all at once. In Son Issue Number 10, Chris revealed images of his imaginary future wife, Lovely Weather. In September 2017, he remarks that he had fulfilled his comics prediction, following his entering into a relationship with his newest sweetheart, Jessica Quinn. However, this was not meant to be, as she broke up with him in early October 2017. He posted on Facebook a few weeks later, saying that he did not need a significant other to define himself, hinting that he may have given up on his love quest, but only time will tell. In January of 2018, prompted by the quick Sonic 2 prequel fan comic, Chris gave his thoughts on the love quest. I really worked too hard on something I should have not pushed too much on, the love quest. I really should have focused more on Sonichu, his life and all of that. Instead, I did too much with myself. I was more selfish back then. I really regret that I was. I had done a lot of damage to everyone around me. The idea guys and the end of Chris's love quest. During the Idea Guys saga, Chris's belief in multiple dimensions was exploited and his sense of reality hijacked to make changes to many of Chris's characters, concepts, and perspectives of the real world, with him considering them to be valid. Ideas involving the love quest include Chris being brainwashed into thinking of himself as bisexual, Chris believing he's in a polyamorous marriage with his imaginary friends. Beginning March 2018, Chris's already weak grasp on reality having been eroded further by the Idea Guy's influence, he believed himself to be in a polyamorous marriage with Mewtwo and three of his own fictional characters. In April 2018, the Idea Guys had manipulated Chris into believing that he was bisexual. In April, Chris recorded Dick Licker That Is I, a video of him giving his imaginary husband Magichan a blowjob. Two weeks later, Chris flirted with Brian Frogboy over the internet. He also began to kiss men on the cheek in public, fan co-pits in May and several attendees at the Too Many Games convention in June leading him to be kicked out. Chris's belief in the polyamorous marriage was so strong that he told Whiskers, a female fan cosplaying as him, that he wasn't interested in dating her. And in July 2018, he also rebuffed a professed potential sweetheart, Miss Cherry. Showing no further interest in finding real-world China for himself, the love quest has come, if not to an underwhelming yet bizarre conclusion. At least to a long interlude, not quite like anything before it in Christory. It seems that, in a sense, the real love quest was the friends that Chris made along the way, quite literally. That being said, even in this state, Chris occasionally indicated his disappointment in not finding a romantic partner that actually exists. In one such post, he once again blames the trolls for his inability to find a woman instead of making an effort to reach out to someone offline that doesn't involve waving a sign around and loitering on private property. With that post, Chris projected that he had a good Valentine's Day and that all the trolls were miserable when in actuality he spent it holed up in his house with his mother and pets, probably still depressed about his lot in life. Additionally, when speaking with Kwai Sandbag, Chris indicated that he was still lonely and had considered one of the members of Preter for a potential relationship, but put it off under the belief that Magic Chain would soon cross into 1218. It still remains to be seen whether Chris will consider revamping his love quest again, or if he will continue to hold down for Magic Chain. Also, sorry to stop right here. I keep finding conflicting things. Is it pronounced Preter or Preter? I'm not really sure, and I would just like to know going forward. The final end of the love quest. The true end of this saga was made clear near the end of June. The boyfriend-free girl he had searched for all these years had been hiding under his nose, and a pile of garbage this whole time. Unfortunately, this end is not what we all pictured, and the falling actions of this story likely involve him reliving the hour of Julie reveals herself day after day in prison because we, the people of 1218, would never let them be together. I don't know, I feel like this article might be a touch out of date given the fact that Chris is now walking among us once more. Speaking of, let's take a little peek on what the quickie has to say about Chris's new potential heart suite. According to the Post Jail Sightings 2023 page, Chris was spotted at 14 Branchland Court, but then he was also spotted at a food lion with a woman. Let's see what they have to say. 
On the same day as the 14 Branch Land sighting, Twitter user BNDJNKY cited Chris at the Food Lion Ruckersville location talking with a woman at a Coinstar machine. This was the first time Chris was recorded speaking since his release. Sheets slash On the Road Part 2. On the 9th of September 2023, Discord user DooDooFard2874 posted on the official Quickie server that he had found Chris on the road and followed him to a Sheets convenience store. He apparently ran after Chris, though Chris thankfully pulled out of the parking lot and drove off before he could reach him, driving away from Charlottesville, Virginia with the same woman from the Food Lion sighting. He provided four photos and a video with no audio, along with the following account. I saw him, we followed him, at an intersection I ran up to him and yelled their name, we followed him to his sheets and he pulled into the parking lot, I ran after him and he pulled out of the lot and I yelled, Chris Chan, we love you! Then he went out on the highway and we lost him. DooDooFard2874 also reportedly took a photo of Chris, though it appears to have been lost. DooDooFard is most definitely a ween and not a keen one either. DooDooFard2874 was banned from the server shortly after he posted about his sighting, or I'm sorry, Chase, and fellow Quickie server members found that his Facebook account was linked to his Discord account. DooDooFard2874 promptly deleted his Discord account and privated his Facebook. Walmart, September. On the 16th, Chris was spotted with a woman who was first seen with Chris at Food Lion at a Walmart in Bedford, Virginia. A poster on r slash Chris Chan Sonichu posted that a friend had photographed Chris and taken a video. Chris's cart contains two yoga mats and LED strips. It also has food such as tomatoes, peanuts, peanut butter, and whipped topping. He is wearing a My Little Pony shirt and seems to have the medallion on underneath his shirt. CVS on the 17th, CVS employee and Reddit user Just Curious Ox claimed to have seen Chris at the CVS in Lynchburg and alleged the following, in reference to Chris and the woman companion who was first seen with him at Food Lion. She was just all over that woman, just kept touching her and had her hands on the back almost the whole time. When asked for photo proof, Just Curious Ox posted a thread on the 20th, uploading two photos of Chris and the woman together, clarifying in a comment that the photos were of Chris hugging the mystery girl close, then him kissing mystery girl. Just Curious Ox claimed other details, such as she seemed uncomfortable and kept her head down mostly, that Chris seemed like he was kind of leading the shopping trip, he was also very close to her at all times. Coworker asked if they needed help, Chris made sure to step so he was between my coworker and the girl, and that the woman paid. At least we have some potential confirmation he isn't fucking his mother. God, you know it's bad when that's the main saving grace, somebody isn't fucking their own mom. But yeah, Chris might actually have his own heart suite. All the power to him, I guess, but I can only imagine that this is going to end very poorly. Oh well, time will tell. And with that said, that's going to be it for today's video. If you like what I do, leave a comment, rate, and subscribe. If you want to support me in a more personal way, you can check out the Patreon link and the Teespring link in the description. I've got more content coming down the pipeline. But until then, I'll see you degenerates next time. Baba Bowie.